Hello everyone, I'm uh, Nicholas, a research assistant and PhD student at the U University of Southern Denmark Center for Energy Informatics. And what I'll be presenting today is an agent-based modeling framework, so essentially a methodology, for the simulation of uh, large-scale consumer participation in uh, electricity market use systems. So let's maybe try to deconstruct some of the keywords in that title before moving on to the methodology itself. So um, what do we mean by consumer participation in electricity markets? So that's essentially consumers that are adapting their consumption schedules and plans to um, market price signals. And so that has benefits not only for the consumers in order to in in the sense that they reduce their overall electricity bill, but also for other stakeholders such as grid operators, we can reduce, which can reduce congestion, or the need to have less need for active uh, and expensive uh, reserves, uh, and then also, for example, for wind turbine operators, uh, as demand can consume more at times where wind is is blowing more. So if there's so many benefits to it, how come um, this uh, demand side response is not more widespread? And to answer this question, I want to refer to you to this print uh, survey done in the paper uh, that I've added as a reference uh, in the bottom right here. Uh, and the question was, uh, a set of questions uh, were asked to the consumers in terms of what are the most perceived barriers to the adoption of a demand response. And some of the uh, re recurring terms that were given in the answers are words such as risk, uncertain, or unknown, which essentially shows that one of the main problems for consumers is this uh, risk perception for adopting demand response. And there the power of simulation becomes apparent because essentially by implementing realistic um, scenarios of the market context in which consumers would have to evolve, it would allow them to evaluate better and uh, test out different scenarios to decide whether demand response is actually suited for them or not. And that brings us to the problem of the, the market in itself, right? So market structures have evolved in the recent de decades from a more centralized monopolistic structure where the consumer would buy their energy from one single agent to a more destructured um, system where consumers could buy energy in one market, but then also provide short-term balancing services in another market, buy additional capacity in a third market, etc. And so that creates quite a complex ecosystem which um, would probably where consumers would need some tools to help them navigate this ecosystem of some markets. So whatever tool we develop has to be able to adapt to these different contexts. So for example, a consumer located in China might have might face a more centralized context, while someone in Europe might face, face this more decentralized context with different market options. Then uh, within a certain context, we have changing market designs as rules are changing when the when market contexts are changing. So the increase in renewables, for example, in Europe. And finally, the uh, consumer itself might have different uh, preferences depending on their risk averseness, for example. And so uh, one consumer might prefer to participate in one market with more short-term prices, and one with more long-term uh, prices, and one with higher variability, uh, lower variability, etc. So we need to allow this tool to uh, the, need to allow the consumers to have this plug-and-play approach. So the challenge overall we're trying to answer is to combine model accuracy to be, to be be really context specific, but also model adaptability to um, tackle the diversity of context which consumers well, might need to face. Uh, and so uh, whatever methodology we implement um, has to be consistent yet modular in order to provide a reusable modeling approach that also allows comparability between the results. Um, so how do we go about implementing that? Um, and for that, I want to just um, highlight three kind of main points. The first one being that uh, we assume the consumer is uh, directly participating in some markets, um, which means that we're not using market intermediaries such as uh, suppliers or aggregators, which usually have their own kind of strategy. And that kind of um, uh, makes the price signals less transparent between the market and the consumer. Uh, so that's only possible. This direct market participation is is possible because we are looking at large scale consumers with enough consumption volumes. 
Uh, a second point is that uh, each of these submarkets is considered as agents of their own, with their own logic. And so uh, that's where the use of agent-based modeling comes into play, right? Because there's uh, information exchanges between each of these uh, submarkets, which has their own logic, but also exchange of information between the consumer and the submarket, of course. And the third point is that uh, whatever market prices um, that are being um, shown by a submarket is not generated within the market itself, but imported as exogenous data. Uh, and that allows to uh, stay stick to realistic scenarios, uh, but because for example, data is based on historical prices, as, so historical contexts. But uh, that, um, on the other hand, um, does not permit to have more hypothetical context where we test out the impact of consumer actions on market prices. Um, so now how do we go about implementing that? Um, so the, the model uh, methodology really relies on the concept of object-oriented programming, which in this case was implemented uh, through uh, AnyLogic, which is a Java-based uh, software uh, that uh, allows to implement agent-based uh, modeling. So the language here is really based on, on Java. Uh, and so when we look at object-oriented programming, the concept is to use some methods which provide a certain structure or a skeleton to the model. And then when these methods are then combined with data to uh, instantiate some objects which um, create some context-specific applications. And so if we look at uh, a uh, electricity market, there's some analogies we can draw with that in the sense that any electricity market is made up of certain roles. For example, a consumer that is going to buy electricity, a seller that is going to sell electricity, um, and some market operator that is connecting the seller to the buyer. Uh, the question is then who is uh, um, going to take up the, each of these roles, right? And that's where the context specificity comes into play. And so this is why, why differentiation has been done between the roles, which are context independent, and whose, um, let's say, main functions are, are defined by interfaces and abstract classes. And then we have agents, which provide this context specific implementation of the roles uh, as agents take up roles. Now, this uh, creates some um, re abstraction and reusability because uh, if we have two different market contexts, market context one might look like what is shown on the right with five different roles distributions, while market context two might have these roles uh, assigned in a different way. But uh, the benefit is that these roles don't have to recode, be recoded from scratch and only have to be uh, implemented by another agent. Um, so that uh, allows some consistency. Now, uh, how can we improve on that? And this is where the use of abstract classes becomes uh, interesting. So um, to define a certain market, usually uh, there's some parameters that we need to implement, such as the market closing time, the bid time resolution, the bid size. And so we can spare the modeler the effort of having to redefine these parameters every time and tell essentially uh, that any submarket to be instantiated has to have these parameters as part of itself. So that's why these this P role abstract classes is linked to a specific submarket role. And then uh, we can push it even further, knowing that uh, certain, um, so bear in mind that the interfaces that each role implements as are empty interfaces, um, and that needs to be then filled in with a certain logic. And this logic can be predefined, because if we look at the literature, we realize that um, there's only a limited amount of ways in which a market can be implemented. So if we look at the clearing mechanism, uh, here I've shown the two most standard ways of clearing bids, either as bilateral contracts or through a centralized exchange. And each of these two ways represent two different algorithms which you could follow and so these algorithms can be predefined in these uh, abstract classes called F role so in the, the specific uh, market role um, and then whatever agent is instantiating this role will just have to call one or the other of these um, clearing mechanisms to, to instantiate this, this submarket so now that we've explained what uh, the, the, the purpose of these abstract classes we can see how all of these elements fit together so we see here um, that the role in this gray square ha implements uh, has 
multiple interfaces and these abstract classes assigned to it. And within the interface uh, are the characteristic methods that really define the main logic of uh, this role. And so these um, these characteristic methods can be, of course, influenced by these predefined uh, market mechanisms that were explained in the previous slide, um, but then will also be influenced by the agent itself and the context. So that's where the strategy methods of the agent come into play. Now, these characteristic methods also need some inputs and some outputs, which have a certain format, which is context independent. And that's defined by the flow methods. But then, of course, who these uh, roles are interacting with will very much depend on the context and the market structure. And so that's where the connection methods that are given by the agent will tell the role which agent it has to communicate with. Um, and so here, here really, we, we start to see this kind of differentiation between context-independent and context-dependent element of a model. Um, now, how does that look like when we implement it in a specific market context, in this case, the Danish context? Um, so for this study, we've taken three different submarkets, the day ahead submarket, the intraday submarket, and the primary frequency submarket. I won't spend time explaining uh, what these submarkets are. The important thing is to know that they're all um, serve different purposes and so have different um, operational logics. And so the test really is to see how applicable our method is to these three different submarkets. So the first step in setting up a model would then be to identify the different roles that are needed to, to implement these submarkets. And so if these submarkets are represented by the gray boxes here, the roles are the dark blue uh, boxes, um, and the agents implementing those submarkets are the light blue uh, squares that are the North Pool agent, implementing both the day end market and the intraday market, and the TSO agent, uh, the transmission system operator, which is in charge of the FCR market. Um, and then let's not forget our large-scale consumer, who is both consumer and energy trader, as we assume direct market participation. Uh, and so here we've identified the different roles and agents required in our minimum viable ecosystem, which we are going to model. Now, once we've done that, we can draw the ecosystem map where the different interactions between the roles are defined. And here we really see the advantage of separating between roles and agents, because if we look at the energy trader, it seems like quite a complex role, which is in charge of different interactions. Um, but if we assumed a different business model where, for example, the energy trader role was taken up by a market intermediary, this could uh, be done relatively easily uh, by using the same role, just implementing it through a different agent. And so that really provides reusability to our model. Now, another interesting feature is if we look at here, the market operator role is actually taken up by all three sub-markets. Um, and so let's dive in a bit more into detail into this market operator role. Um, here on the left, we see uh, the interfaces and abstract classes that would be needed to implement this role uh, with their methods and attributes. And on the right, we see how what values would be uh, used to implement this specific role in all three submarkets. So what we see is that uh, we can generate these submarkets relatively easily just by changing the value which these uh, p-roll parameters are taking and uh, by selecting different um, clear mechanisms and pricing mechanisms in our F-roll uh, predefined abstract class. So that really provides some consistency, but also ease of implementation for the user. And then finally, uh, to, to wrap up on what we've seen, um, so what we've done essentially is to use object-oriented programming concepts to the electricity market, to the modeling of the electricity market, by uh, by differentiating between context-independent building blocks, which are the commonalities, and the context-dependent building blocks. Um, and so different submarkets can be implemented by using the, the same building blocks, which provides some model consistency and also reusability. Uh, and that's a lot that improves the comparison of results between different uh, model results. Now, the focus has been on standardization and parameterization of market mechanisms. Now, of course, work remains to be done in terms of standardizing and parameterizing um, the large-scale consumers participating in those markets, um, so that eventually the idea is that for a specific type of consumer we can then and a specific type of market, we can then link a given or, a, let's say, a most suitable market strategy to link this consumer to the context and the market context in which it is involving.
Uh, so I hope uh, this presentation has given you some interesting thoughts, um, which I'll be happy to, to discuss with you. And if you have any questions, um, those might be hard to answer online, um, but uh, you feel free to write to me. Uh, I'll be always happy to, to answer and discuss that further. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I guess have a good day, night, wherever you are. Thank you.